Hi friends. Welcome to First Church. I'm Haley. And I'm Kelsey. We're the Lucianos. <laughs> if you would, please take a moment to sign in so that we know you're here. You can do that by visiting www.firstchurchbhm.com slash sign in. It's crazy to think that uh, we've been going to church here for four years now. It truly really is an open place for all where no one judges you for giving silly facts in your welcome videos. Such as, if you didn't know, today is actually National Velociraptor Awareness Day. 
So then we hope that you enjoy the sermon today and we will see you guys later. Bye friends. Hi, I am Linda Thorne, the children's minister here at First Church. And I am so glad you are worshiping with us today. I have several fun announcements to share with you today. So I decided to come to you from our children's elementary area because it's just a fun place to be. Today, April 18th, the children's ministry will gather at Homewood Central Park at 3 p.m. for what we are calling Popsicles in the Park. This is just a time to hang out with your church family while the kids play in the park and of course, have a Popsicle. No matter what age child you are, you are welcome. We will be at Pavilion number three from 3 to 4.30 p.m. and would love to see you. Registration is not required for this event. To continue enjoying creation and parks, the fun team is planning a pop-up picnic at Railroad Park. This is a church-wide event on Sunday, May 2nd, right after our 11 a.m. worship. If you plan to participate in virtual worship, that is okay. Just meet us there around 1215. We will gather on the grassy area next to the 17th Street Plaza. Bring your chairs or blankets and a picnic lunch. The fun team will provide bottled water and a special treat for everyone from Still City Pops. Registration is not required for this event. Two summer events that do require registration are camps for kids. Registration is live now on our church website for our preschool camp and our elementary arts camp. The preschool camp will be June 26 from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. The elementary arts camp is the week of July 19 through 23 from 9 to 1 daily. Both camps will involve interactive Bible stories, crafts, percussion, and so much more. And of course, lots of fun. Campers and volunteers can register right now at www.firstchurch.com under the coming up tab. Now, as we continue to ready our hearts and minds for worship, please make sure to like and share this video and greet each other in the comment section.
This morning's first scripture reading comes from Psalm 104, and I'll be reading verses 10 through 23 from the Living Bible Translation. Hear these words. He places springs in the valley and streams that gush from the mountain. They give water for all the animals to drink. There the wild donkey quenches their thirst, and the birds nest beside the streams and sing in the branches of the trees. He sends rain upon the mountain and fills the earth with fruit. The tender grass grows up at his command to feed the cattle. And there are fruit trees, vegetables, and grain for man to cultivate, and wine to make him glad, and olive oil as lotion for his skin, and bread to give him strength. The Lord planted the cedars of Lebanon and they are tall and flourishing. There are birds make their nest, the storks in their furs. High in the mountain are pastures for the wild goat and rock badgers burrow in among the rocks and find protection there. He assigned the moon to mark the months and the sun to mark the days. He sends the night and darkness when all the forest folks come out. Then the young lion roars for their food, but they are dependent on the Lord. At dawn, they slink back into their dens to rest, and men go off to work until the evening shadows fall again. Amen. At this time, I invite you um, to join me in prayer, and at the end, I invite you to, um, where you are, join us in saying the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. Creator God, we come to you as a piece of your creation. Too often we forget our place among the trees and the mountains, looking at them simply for beauty and enjoyment and forgetting that they are also a reflection of your love and peace and grace. While we are busy moving about, Creator, we invite you to slow us down, to still our busy hearts and minds so that we can find our place amongst your creation as your beloved, also created in your image. Thank you for all that you do to continue to remind us of this connection, remind us of who we are and who we are in you. And so, Creator, we say the prayer and join together as a diverse body scattered throughout your creation 
So let us pray the prayer that you taught us in scripture. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, the vapor of it all. It's a chasing of the wind, the powers of the earth. So pale and thin, we will set our hearts on you again. Holy, you, O oh God, are holy. Trees clap their hands for you, oceans they dance. And taunts the hearts of men We can feel it from within The beauty of it all The mystery The swelling of a voice A rising sea
My name is Katie Gilbert, and I serve as our executive pastor. This morning, I invite you to hear these words from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you by worrying can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work, and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you that even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses grass in the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? Gentiles long for all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, stop worrying about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This morning, as we move into our time of offering, I want to remind you that in this year's Justice and Mercy, Mercy budget, we set aside funds to be given to a local organization doing work against environmental changes and climate crisis in our community. If this sermon series, Learning from Indigenous Wisdom, has stirred something inside of you, we, and you would like to be a part of determining where those funds uh, should be allocated, I invite you to reach out to our Justice and Mercy Minister, Tiffany Dowdy. You can reach her at tiffany at firstchurchbhm.com. We here at First Church are working really hard to find ways to be in better reciprocal relationship with the environment around us. We hope that you will jump on board and find ways that we can continue this important work together. And the only way that we are able to do so is through your generosity. So this morning, I invite you to give because we are indeed created in the image of a loving and generous God.
Good morning. As we explored last week, when we dug deep into our creation narratives, we have much that we can learn from our siblings who are indigenous to the land that we now call home. Today, I believe we're gonna explore the single most important learning that if we can come to embody can change our relationship with all of creation. It's one that is deeply woven into the very being of those who called this land home first. It's also one that unfortunately, I believe, is a divine principle that we as Americans and we as American Christians have yet to embrace, much to our detriment. It's the principle of reciprocity. You see, our cultural narrative says that it's by hard work and determination that we have what we have. If you put your nose to the grindstone and you work hard, then you will be able to overcome obstacles. It's individualistic, it's pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and it fails the majority of people. But we perpetuate it anyway. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe that work is good and we are called to work. When we go back to our creation narrative, we see our first job is to tend the earth. We were the gardeners and the caretakers and our work was good, it was reciprocal. In Genesis, we were instructed to tend the earth and in return, the earth would take care of us. Work was honorable and our work equated a living wage as it provided for our shelter, our food and our drink. There was established from our very beginning what was intended to be a reciprocal relationship, not a one-sided one. What we have developed over time though is much more one-sided. Where in the name of progress, we demand and desire more and more from creation to make things bigger and better. But we have taken without little concern for attending to the soil and the air and the water that brings us life. Consumption has consumed our minds and the divine offers us a lighter load, a lighter load that we heard that expressed in our gospel text this morning. This passage invites us to worry less because at its heart, we are meant to see that we're in reciprocal relationship and united with creation. We don't have to worry about what to eat because if we tend to creation, creation tends to us. We aren't supposed to worry about what we will wear as if it could add value to our being. God knows our needs and has set the universe in motion to care for those who care for the universe. And somehow indigenous people intuited this and lived with this knowledge. Let me share with you some examples from braiding sweetgrass of how reciprocity is woven into creation as a model for us. Did you know that the word pecan comes from indigenous languages? Pigan is a nut, any nut. When indigenous people uh, around Lake Michigan were uprooted and marched to the Midwest, they found groves of nut trees along the rivers. And they didn't recognize these nut trees. They didn't have a proper name for them. So they called them pigans, nuts. It became pecan in English. There is surprisingly much we can learn from pecan or nut trees. Nut trees don't produce a harvest of nuts every year. They follow an unpredictable cycle called mast fruiting. In this way, the trees save up and store their energy until they can produce a large crop of nuts to help generate a new forest. You see, if they only produced a few nuts each year, well, those would be eaten by predators. So they overwhelm the forest floor with a huge supply in hopes that some will not be consumed and help repopulate their grove. But what confounds scientists is that they do not do this individually. They do this collectively. It's not a first come first serve fruiting contest for the trees. The trees with better sunlight and water supply do not rush to drop fruit and tell other trees, too bad for you. Instead, they do it together. Not just one tree, not just one group of trees in a grove, not just one grove in a forest, not just one forest, but somehow trees across the state act as a collective. Clemmer writes, exactly how they do this, we don't know. But what we see is the power of unity. What happens to one happens to all. We can starve together or we can feast together. All flourishing is mutual. Scientists are considering that the communication between trees may be done underground. As the fungal strands of the roots connect to one another, they are able to redistribute wealth for necessary carbohydrates from tree to tree. Klimmer calls this the Robin Hood approach of taking from the rich and giving to the poor so that the trees have the same carbon surplus at the same time, allowing them to work together to produce the fruit. She says they weave a web of reciprocity, giving and taking. 
And this way, trees act as one, connected by the fungi. Maybe some of you are gardeners. In fact, I know many of you are gardeners. So maybe you've heard about the three sister garden. This is the indigenous method of gardening. And much like the tree's interconnection and reciprocity, the three sisters teach us similar lessons. The sisters are corn, beans, and squash. And unlike our American approach, you don't plant these in single lines separated from one another, but circularly. When you plant them, the first to grow is the corn. She shoots up straight and stiff, making an excellent trellis for the bean. The bean begins to grow, and as the corn strives for height, she begins to extend herself in a vine around the stalk. Now, had the corn been too slow, the bean would outpace her. But being that the corn is the fastest growing, it works excellently. Finally, the squash is the last to begin to grow, and she begins to offer her wide leaves that shelter the ground from the sun. You see, the corn offers the stability that the bean needs to flourish, and the squash offers shade and helps retain moisture in the soil for all three plants. Now, maybe you're wondering, well, what does the bean contribute? This is the best part. All plants need nitrogen to grow. We have plenty of nitrogen in our atmosphere at 78%. But plants need mineral nitrogen. Atmospheric nitrogen, Klimmer says, is like having a needed food locked in a pantry beside someone who's hungry. It's there, but you can't access it. That is unless you are a member of the bean family. Beans have the ability through a relationship with a bacterium that naturally is present in the soil to transform atmospheric nitrogen into mineral nitrogen by creating nodules on their roots. These nodules then fertilize the soil for the corn and the squash, allowing all three to flourish. Each plant does what it's created to do in order to flourish, yet its flourishing does not diminish the other plants from flourishing too. Instead, it actually helps to propel each other's growth and productivity. This is reciprocity. They also make an excellent meal. Creation works together for flourishing, and we are meant to be a part of that creational pattern. Part of our role is taking, but taking with consideration. We, like, like for example, take sweetgrass. Sweetgrass is a sacred plant in the indigenous culture. It's braided and it's given as gifts and used in sacred ceremonies. But taking of sweetgrass is important. It's been dwindling in many areas for years, and the fear had been that it had been harvested too much or it wasn't harvested properly. So studies were done on the methods of pulling sweetgrass. And what was in fact discovered was that sweetgrass dies when it is not taken, when it's not harvested, and that the method of harvesting mattered less as long as one followed indigenous wisdom, which teaches never take more than half. You leave the rest for others because there will always be others who are in need. Our harvesting of the bounty of the earth spurs it on to produce more as long as we don't take too much. If we follow the principle of picking only what we need, never taking more than half, and making sure there is more than one source available, then our earth would be tended well and we would have our needs continually met. It's as if Job reminded his friends who thought that all wisdom in the world when, when he faced trouble came from them. We should learn to listen and take note from our siblings in creation. And they've been putting on quite a show for us this morning. Job 12, 7 through 12 says this, but ask the animals what they think. Let them teach you. Let the birds tell you what's going on. Put your ear to the earth learn the basics. Listen, the fish in the ocean will tell you their stories. Isn't it clear that they all know and agree that God is sovereign and he holds all things in his hand? Every living soul, yes, every breathing creature, isn't this all just common sense, as common as the sense of taste? Do you think the elderly have a corner on wisdom? That you have to grow old before you understand life? Job knew creation around him understood the nature of God in ways that we often struggle to accept and to conceive. If we would return to listening to the trees, watching how our gardens grow best, and learning from the elements, we would surely see a more unified way to live. 
one, that like the groves of nut trees ensure not just some, but all flourish and produce a harvest. One, like the three sisters, where each does their part so that they're better together than separated and alone. One that is spurred on to give more when there is need, so long as the giving is not abused. If we stop thinking of ourselves as individuals and instead as a collective with all beings, those that look like us and those that flower, croak, neigh, rustle with the wind and silently float in the water, then we might find ourselves fulfilling our call to tend the earth and find ourselves cared for in return. I want to encourage you this week to give some intentional consideration to what you take from creation. Your food, your energy, your joy, your safety. What does creation provide for you tangibly and intangibly? And then another day, I want you to consider what you give back to creation. What food, what energy, joy, safety do you provide for it? Now, don't let yourself stop short at your yard being beautifully maintained or the fact that you recycle, or that you try to monitor your thermostat inside. How are you honoring your relationship to the others, as the geese did, as muskrat did, and as sky woman did? How are you dancing with gratitude, protecting Mother Earth, and cultivating safety for all beings? It's a challenge. It's a challenge for us all because we haven't been taught this way to live. But if we're seeking to be indigenous to the land, we must learn to be reciprocal in our living, tending to the earth so that our children and grandchildren have a future home. May we intentionally look for ways to pattern our lives after reciprocity, offering thanks for the gifts that are given to us, and in return, giving of ourselves and what we can provide so that others can flourish too, so that we may flourish abundantly together because that is how our lives are meant to be. Thanks be to God. Amen. My name is Charles Alexander. I invite you to join with me in our Affirmation of Faith, written by Kelly Sherman Conroy of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. We believe in Creator, Father, Mother, Spirit, who called the world and all that is in it into being, who spoke the creative forming word, and all came forth, who created women and men, and set them free to live in love, in obedience to the will of supreme love, and in community with all. We believe in Creator, Son, and Brother, who because of love, beyond our understanding, love for creation entered the world to share our humanity, to rejoice and to despair, to set before us the paths of life and death and walk them with us, to be rejected and die, but finally to conquer death and bind the world to himself for all time. We believe in Creator, indwelling Spirit, who invites us into community that we may through faith and that community of oneness experience uplifting and sustaining peace and grace, that we may fulfill our human responsibility to reach out to our neighbor, whoever that may be, that we may rejoice in the constant nature of creation and the wondrous joy of life itself. We believe in Creator, whose word teaches us that all things grow together, the circle of life, that the paths of life and death, good and evil, too often come together, that choices are not clearly defined, but that we confidently and responsibly tread the path we, we choose and only the true one can be our judge. We believe in Creator who is present and working in this world through all creation. Amen.
Now go in peace. Listening to creation, taking what you need, offering what you have to give, and treading softly on the land. In the name of the one who gifts us with air, with soil, with trees, with water, with joy, with life. In the name of our creator, our savior and sustainer. Alleluia. Amen. No 
oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine.